Now, this is our first event in February. And so I'm delighted to have you all here. Sorry, we can't have a big audience, but um, a little audience is better than no audience, I think, and given the current restrictions. Um, before I introduce Jennifer, I do want to, I, I hope you've all noticed the new paint outside as you came in. I'm very proud we've been able to totally repaint the building and we did some repairs and everything along, along the way. It looks really gorgeous. So thank you for all of you who helped make that effort possible. Um, we've also acquired a wonderful new instrument over here, a seven foot four inch Yamaha brand. Uh, and if you go to YouTube and search for James Moore Meeting House, we have an inaugural concert that uh, George Moore, my fellow board member in the back, has just finished recording. What we did is, we knew we couldn't have an in-person concert, so we invited, what, 18 musicians, George? Uh, I think 20. 20 musicians, OK. Uh, both professionals and students. And they all perform one piece. And the performances are amazing. So go to YouTube, look for James Moore Meeting House, and you'll find, you'll hear, this wonderful new piano. Another thing we've done in the last two months is our bell up in the tower. It was put up there in 1866. And apparently, it's kind of like you have to change your oil in your car every 2,000 miles or whatever. Well, you have to restore the bell every 150 years. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, the whole wooden wheel, the oak wheel that the rope goes around and swings it, collapsed. <laughs> and fortunately, um, the fellow board member in the back uh, managed to find Dick Winter, who's an expert in boat repair, and put this whole thing together. And so it was working beautifully again. So those are just some of the things we've been doing while we couldn't do anything. Anyway, with that, um, I do want to introduce Jennifer. I first met her last holiday season. We, she sent her an email, offered to do a reading of the Charles Dickens Christmas Carol. And I hey, we were just fun. <laughs> it was so great. <laughs> what you did. She has memorized. And so when she came back and proposed this, I said, oh, of course, uh, we want to have you here. So I don't think I need to say anything more about you, but uh, everyone will hear how wonderful you are. And, uh, so with that, uh, I'll leave you. Thank you. Anything that stays a baby for 70 years is suspect. 
<laughs> the avatar of boomerhood, in fact, uh, born June 14, 1946, is, the, uh, is presently ensconced in the White House, even as we speak. So that should go a long way towards explaining a lot of things, but not nearly enough. It doesn't completely account how or how we've arrived at the dead center of this treacherous trifecta, this political implosion, global pandemic, and now a racial reckoning. Now, I'm concentrating on the racial thing. It's the uh, third jewel in the craziness corona. But uh, I was trying to sell this idea long ago, and way before my little fingertips ever touched my keyboard. And I pitched it this way. The piece itself is irreverent but respectful, relevant, real, and 51% funny. Well, aside from my clear penchant for alliteration, neither to an old boomer broad, to uh, not only think she is the one to make 400 years of unspeakable cruelty and oppression to any degree of using, but that she should even try to make it funny in the first place. I mean, I might be wrong, but I think that's at least qualifying as an example of what puts up with nothing else. But the topic, I mean, this is not the sound of music here. This is, this is tough. It's kind of unfunny. So I have a feeling that the amusing thing that I was going for is really more attached to nervous laughter. Mine, not yours. But before I continue walking this self-constructed plank, whatever your politics, can we all agree that We've been living in a world that's just a couple of years ago seemed like overwrought science fiction. But my God, eight months ago, Queen COVID started her reign of terror, and then by the summer there'd been a subterranean convulsion that would have registered 11 on the Richter scale of social upheaval, if there were such a scale. As the most significant sea change in that human construct and race that was seen on this continent for the last 400 years, and I'm including the Emancipation Proclamation. And it's that upheaval, that reckoning, that spawned this sudden kind of squeamish discussion of white privilege. The term that suddenly just covered the nation like hives, like COVID. Well, who, who, what is it? Who can get it? Who's got it? Maybe we got it. Or I know I do. And I, I've known a long time. I, I just didn't know what to call it. I've got to start somewhere. This seemed like a great idea, writing this little one woman show skin in the game thing. How did white of me, really? Rooted as it is, however, in my sincere desire to free myself from. But what I've come to see is the crippling effects of that teeny tiny titanic little white lie told eons ago. It's like a boy with plutonium, I swear, that being a white human being is in some way inherently superior to being a human being of any other color. It turns out that that ancient seminal slander is called, with a remarkable lack of imagination, colorism. But that's the Grendel's mother of the monstrous racism that I see ravaging the country on a daily basis. And its byproduct is that white privilege, that racism white, that makes sodium nitrate acts like a preservative to keep that monster fresh and alive. That I'm finally ready to do battle. But I'm way late to this part. People of color have been fighting one form or another of this battle for the better part of three millennia, never more so than in the past two centuries, when this land of the free home of the brave itself birthed into being by the midwife slavery, managed to bring that abomination to its highest, most horrific level. Yeah, our copper nation made it an art form of evil. According to historian Ariel Gross, and I'm paraphrasing here, for the first time in history, a segment of humanity was deleted from the human race and placed in a subgroup which would remain enslaved for generations in perpetuity. I wonder if that was the first official example of American exceptionalism. <laughs> and now you sound harsh. I kind of feel harsh. Maybe I'm just a slave to fashion, but I think I'm beginning to qualify 
sorry, is a woke want. <laughs> Believe me, it's not only kind of unattractive, but it's very, very inconvenient. But you know, it has occurred to me, isn't it bad enough that black people have had to suffer 400 years of prejudice, injustice, oppression, and have to now suffer we woke whites who decided <laughs> to be, that we're the vanilla victims of white privilege? And like me, are keening and wailing over the ignorance and entitlement we've been forced to endure, the unfair advantages which we've taken unfair advantage of, that has led us to become accidental racists. And now we're begging in a kind of whining, newly demanding, whitish sort of way that black people show us additional forbearance as we now offer them our ostentatiously overwrought, centuries overdue, mea culpas. In fact, I'm amazed that a horde of woke whites are breaking those doors down right now, desperate to give their white privilege testimony. But truth to tell, I, I guess I was figuring that black people should want to help me, poor little thing that I am in my righteous endeavor, because, well, my receptors have been blunted, my social, moral antenna have been stunted by this white privilege. At least they've got to listen to my Fashion. They've got to accept my apology. They've got to let me feel useful. They've got to act like they like me. Like they really like me, like Sally Field. <laughs> Acknowledge how hard I'm trying at the very least. Give me some credit. I'm the victim of white privilege, too. They have to understand how I have suffered. <laughs> I'm being a little facetious here. A saner, though sadly much smaller part of me now recognizes that my black fellow citizens might not necessarily be all that interested in my journey from accidental racist to woke white. Maybe not exactly enthusiastic about even witnessing, let alone participating in this, what would you call it, my great whitewash? <laughs> Based on experience, they probably figure my miraculous conversion has a shelf life of somewhere between. 48 and 72 hours, depending on the news cycle. So I finally realized as I began to write this thing that the, the people that maybe I should be speaking to are not the black people at all, but pardon the expression, the white people, like, like me, and like to a certain extent, you. You, you must love hearing this from me. It's several magnitudes worse than listening to a reformed smoker. Oh, for God's sakes, how many of you, the ones that are still here and understand, so bright, so few people, can count you, and I will keep track, how many of you who are still here are taking massive umbrage at what must sound like a holier than that harangue from whom? The ghost of Martin Luther King? Barack Obama? Michelle Obama? Kanahazi Coates? No, just me. Just this preternaturally presumptuous old white woman, who the F do I think I am? But in my defense, I, I am a paragon of equality in one respect. I think I'd be found equally obnoxious by both blacks and whites. So <laughs> there's that. But I gotta admit, with this suffering white privilege thing, it would be a little difficult for me to make my case to black people. I mean, my suffering. My suffering, our suffering, and has been more subtle, more nuanced, more psychologically complex, more subconscious, more white. <laughs> While theirs, forgive me, has been flagrantly obvious. I mean, uh, centuries of enslavement, of ongoing financial, social, political, educational discrimination, bombing, feeding, burnings, lynchings, for God's sake. Prejudice and disempowerment of every stripe, both then and now. Jim Crow laws, redlining, voter suppression, police brutality. I all came up with that Dred Scott decision. And what about that three-fifths of a human thing? My God, are we supposed to compete with that? <laughs> you know, I think it might count with some black people that, that we're finally looking into black American history, which turns out, oddly enough, to be our American history. So yes, suffering in the suffering department, they have had, let's face it, an unfair advantage. But we white people must have suffered. 
Or else how can you explain that the America's first black president, who, like him or not, acquitted himself, oh, except for the baby eating and the blood drinking, but with such <laughs> dignity and grace and courage and intelligence that he's still way high up on those lists of most admired men in the world. That there should come a president of the Caucasian persuasion who seems so otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, he, as the chosen kind of leader of the free world, by definition, must be seen to represent the, the most highly evolved apex, epitome, the zenith, the very best of the white race. I ask you, hold them up <laughs> side by side. Based on that metric, which race, black or white, has over the long term clearly been the most damaged? You see, <laughs> my point is made. It's <laughs> obvious what <laughs> havoc has been wreaked on unsuspecting white people by the silken scourge of white privilege. I don't really know what you other white people are doing. I guess you're either hosting interracial barbecues, maybe, cocktail parties, you're organizing round table chats about accidental racism. Oh, for all I know, you're throwing clan, clan, clan base. Try to say that fast. <laughs> clan, clan base to celebrate the uh, deliberate kind, and that refers back to racism. Okay, thank you. Was that for a second? Um, yes, but let's face it, woke or un, the subject of white privilege is never going to be high on the list of socially appropriate icebreakers. But then again. You may not get a rodent's dairy air right away. You just don't buy it. Maybe most of us don't. This white privilege. Fact, fake news, like, like COVID, like, like climate change, like fibromyalgia. I feel like gluten free anything. <laughs> white privilege, really? East Coast elitist crap. They're the real racists. Those people making it up, making it an issue that doesn't even exist. Get along fine with the black people. And even besides, in this country, the racist bar is set very high indeed. You gotta lynch, rape, burn, crosses, brand flesh, cast abuse of epithets to even be considered a racist in America. And even then, as has been said about some of our leaders, even though they may do or say things that seem racist, we can't be sure they're racist because we don't know what's going on in their minds. And see, most of us don't lynch people. We don't even approve of lynching people. We're not burning crosses on lawns or pushing people to the back of the bus or calling anyone N-word or, or jumping out of a swimming pool because a black person jumps in now or anything like that. We're polite. We're even friendly. Hey, we believe in equality. And, and in spite of the snotty remarks, some of us have black friends. But we have to live in the real world. So we've got to keep proper values in mind. We have to ensure the quality of our children's education. Now, we get to choose where our children go to school. And we get to choose who we live next door to. That It's a free country. But it's, it's after all, the toxic waste dumps have got to go somewhere. And that's not our fault either. Why can't they? Just stop ripping off those 200-year-old scabs and get over it. Make something of themselves. This affirmative action stuff has only weakened them, done them more harm than good. And it's not fair, really, those quotas, getting preferential treatment. It's like reverse racism. Black, white privilege. Black, that's what it is. Black privilege. What's we're so sick and tired of apologizing, trying to do the right thing for our families and being accused of being a racist. I mean, here they are taking advantage of the system, milking it. It's our tax dollars that go into welfare. Look at this pandemic. A lot of them love it. Government's paying them more than they were making. Why do work, right? So, all right, see, sometimes unfair things happen. They happen to us, too. Life isn't fair. And not really nice things, okay, redlining, which I never knew what that really was. Voter suppression, police brutality, if it even exists, they want to defund the police. But that's not really racism, is it? We, we 
don't own slaves. We don't buy and sell people. And that other stuff is just life. And by the way, if it is better to be white, we didn't make it that way either. It just is. So you can go on your East Coast white, bleeding heart, liberal, holier than now rant. We are not listening. Got it? Well, I got it. A lot of us are experts at being white, which is to say, I'm beginning to realize it. We're experts at staying asleep to a huge swath of ourselves, our country, our world. For some of us, though, we, we might never admit it, but I think we believe our whiteness is the single most valuable thing there is about us. So what is it? Whiteness. A notion, really. Or maybe several notions. It can represent what? Cleanliness. Purity. But also a blindness, an emptiness, a lack, something missing, but like a light patch on the wall when you take a picture down, but has a concept. It, it didn't even exist in terms of human beings until after Chris Columbus sailed the ocean blue and discovered India. But no wonder the fact that white privilege is so hard to see against a population that for so long, in the last 10 years, 80% white. It, it's so insidious because it is invisible. And if it's invisible, maybe it's incurable. Like a white rabbit against a snowdrift. It's like some kind of sinister snow blindness or something, except for the people of color who for centuries have seen it but dared not name it. And now that they have named it, well, now, yeah thrown in the fake news barrel. It seems it's so ingrained in the very fiber of our country now that it's almost like a collective birth defect. Because it, it begins to happen at birth, right? Of course, we don't know it, but we whites have been bred, trained, almost hard driven to be default racists. And it gives all the more meaning to white bread. The wonder years, building strong racists 12 ways. Mm -hmm. But it, it didn't start with us, didn't start with our parents. Well, they've been white bread too, as had their parents and their parents, for centuries of parents. But by now, for many of us, our perceptions of the world in some way seem to have been permanently distorted. And because so many of us have been bred not to see people of color as people, as human beings exactly like us, over the centuries, our humanity has become distorted as well. Deformed. Even the greatest of us, the best of us, the white geniuses, the poets, the pathfinders, the heroes, unless they've been directly engaged in eradicating every vestige of the pestilence that still besets this nation and protecting and preserving the equality of all humans, then their light has irrevocably been dimmed. And we all are diminished. Well, look at the iconic family fathers having themselves been white bread. Tragically, they were not thinking of all humans when they put their names to the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. They didn't even mean all men. But it, it wasn't an oversight, an omission. It just simply went without saying that, of course, it only meant men. And of course, it only meant those men who were white. How strange that we whites that for we whites, an absence of something, in this case, skin color, has become a defining factor in what it means to be fully human. Of course, extraordinary progress has been made in the past 65 years in terms of securing rights and privileges again for people of color. But that's been mostly by people of color, thanks to the Herculean efforts of Martin Luther King and an endless line, Rosa Parks, uh, Medgar Evers, but for we humans, white or otherwise, believing that any group of people is superior to any other for any reason in terms of intrinsic human value, is not just the original sin of our country, but of our species. Uh, even though they weren't perfectly manifested, those extraordinary rib scrubbing ideas upon which our nation was founded that all people have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
and that one single notion that makes us exceptional, that a great nation can be formed by the people, young, old, men, women, rich, poor, from all over the world, e pluribus unum. These ideas are so intoxicating. The proof of our power and glory is so convincing. The faith in our exceptional goodness so pervasive, especially in the wake of World War II. I mean, after all, we saved the world, right? That it's no surprise that in 1955, when a little nine-year-old girl me, don't do that. When a little nine-year-old girl, me, sat in the auditorium of the Boston Heights Elementary School and watched Mr. Smith go to Washington, two things happened. I became instantly and permanently an of Jim Stewart. And I felt for the first time a deep, swelling pride in, in our democracy and what it stood for even and especially in the face of the dark forces bent on doing us harm. And I remember a project in sixth grade, working on the Civil War, and there was a story I wrote, because I had the Underground Railroad as my topic, and I wrote a, a fictional story in first person as if I were an 11-year-old runaway slave. Of course, I didn't really grasp the full implications of slavery, just remember, as I wrote, I was scaring myself with the idea of being alone with no family, running through the dark woods at night, not sure if the light I saw through the trees were, was a safe house or a search party trying to recapture me. I realized now that story was for many years as close as I would come to identifying human to human with a person of color. And that girl, she was imaginary. And the thing was, my textbook made it clear that though slavery was very bad, only some people did it. And then Abraham Lincoln freed all the slaves anyway, and then he was shot, and they had reconstruction. And that's when the sneaky carpet baggers from the North came down and took advantage of the poor, war weary Southern people. But whatever happened to those people who had been made slaves and then were freed? What did they do? Where did they go? I don't recall the textbook saying. Somehow, the story was over, that part of it anyway. But in junior high school, it was all about integration. If you had a TV, which we did, black and white, how metaphoric, you know. <laughs> uh, you couldn't miss it. Little Rock, Arkansas in the mid-50s, that knock of neatly dressed, terrified teenagers approaching that line of armed National Guardsmen who were blocking the entrance of the big double doors to Central High School. A puzzlement to my 12 year old self. Clearly, they didn't want Negro students to go to school with white students. But they didn't say why, and it didn't seem right. I was curious, and boy, it was in the news. But in terms of being a topic, topic, pardon me, topic of conversation, it wasn't brought up at my dinner table, it wasn't brought up in my classroom. It it was kind of just like a fact, like the Eskimos make their houses out of ice blocks. It just was. I, don't, I didn't make any real connection between the imaginary runaway slave in my story and those very real, very scared high school kids. They were just characters in two different stories. I had no idea what was happening to me back then, but I do now. Kind of unconscious conspiracy, a kind of smoke and mirrors indoctrination, a compartmentalizing of all the inconvenient truths of our country's history, past and in the making, folded up in boxes and put on a high shelf in the nation's attic, which allowed me and most every other white person in America to you know, separate ourselves from those truths and dismiss what was actually happening. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I this is going to be rude, uncouth, and hopefully not too insulting, but didn't that happen in Nazi Germany too? Mm -hmm. not, not, the, not the brown shirts and, and the Gestapo and the goose step, and the, the nice people, the people who loved their pets and gave to charities at Christmas and worried if their kids weren't home in time for dinner. Those nice people who just didn't allow themselves to know what they knew. In the extraordinary book, Cast, Isabel Wilkerson speaks about the romantic ideal of the old South, the hoop skirts, the pillared mansions, the plantations, 
And she points out that the term plantation was actually a euphemism for concentration camp. What else would you call a place where people were imprisoned, held against their will, and forced to perform unpaid manual labor under deplorable conditions with no recourse, no reprieve, no release? Yeah, that's what they were. Concentration camps with colonies. Even in Germany, I don't think they bought and sold their prisoners. I guess my most memorable, though short-lived, illumination regarding race stands is the moment shortly after my parents had returned from their week's vacation in Antigua in 1963, when my brilliant, sophisticated mother, businesswoman, entrepreneur, graduate of Barnard, creative, kind, generous, remarked to my brothers and me that she'd been amazed when having been asked to dance by an Antiguan, a colored man. No, she discovered that his skin felt like nothing so much as regular skin. She couldn't get over it, and I was thrilled by her enlightened observation. She may as well have been Margaret Mead, as far as I was concerned. I'm so impressed. But of course, what it actually revealed was something quite different, not an illumination at all, but an indication of blindness and ignorance so utter so absolute that it blocked out all the light. I had never really seen those people except theoretically. And when accidentally I did get a glimpse of one through my mother's eyes, it was through a filter apparently so obscured, so distorted that it was worse than blindness. Truly an intellectual, emotional black hole, a white black hole, from which very few of us whites of a certain age certainly have been exempted. The exceptions proving the rule as they generally do. And then in my late teens, maybe in my early 20s, for the first time I noticed ebony on a magazine rack in Arizona. That was a local stationary candy cigarette magazine store in my hometown of Roslyn, Long Island, New York. And I recall flipping through this magazine, fascinated. It was like seeing bits and pieces of a parallel universe. I like magazine, but not. Like the title of that old movie, which actually turned out to be named three times, that tells you something. It was literally and figuratively an imitation of life. An imitation, a shadow of life. Weird. And years later, I remember snidely giggling when I first heard of that Kwanzaa. And that glancing condescension I felt when I discovered there was such a thing as BET. I think that stands for Black Educational Television or black beauty pageants, or anything that seemed like the black version of Americana. I recall once in a while feeling a mixture of pity and impatience. If colored people want to emulate whites and their lifestyles so much, why don't they just, what, try harder? What's with all the self-sabotage, I remember thinking, the fists in the air, the black power stuff. Yeah, self-sabotage, that was my considered opinion. I'm telling you, and this is true, I got queasy writing this stuff then, and I get queasy saying it. Mm -hmm. Well, several years ago, when I was just beginning to wake up, I happened to see some old film footage, maybe on NPR, from the turn of the last century, maybe early 1900s into the 20s, the 30s, city street scenes, Harlem, maybe Chicago. But what I recall most was being suddenly struck by this bustling parade of men, women, kids too, all dressed neatly, nicely, dare I say whitely, busily going about their ordinary daily lives. But the thing is, they were mostly black. Some of them, perhaps only decades removed from slavery, and yet now full citizens, or, or so I'm sure they fervently believed that the country that had enslaved them for centuries, they were expressing kind in their dress and their demeanor what seemed like a clear desire to model themselves after the only other free people they'd ever seen for 300 years, the white people. They were trying so hard to be accepted into a society that was, even then, perhaps it had been for decades, already pushing them backwards into systematic oppression, those ephemeral opportunities they enjoyed during Reconstruction having long since evaporated. But you know, there was barely any mention of it Textbooks I read, but in spite of all those kinds of codes and bylaws that southern and midwestern states passed in order to ensure 
ensure that these enthusiastic new citizens would remain second class forever. 20,000 of people freed from slavery, strong, determined, exceptional people of color, campaigned and were voted into local, state, and national offices until when, in 1887, Reconstruction was summarily ended by guess who? The whites. By then, of course, with many of the Jim Crow laws already in place, a second reconstituted version of slavery had begun. And so, sure enough, whites were still lynching blacks some 80 years later, making America great again, I guess. Yeah, right into the mid 50s, around the same time that kid was watching Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Try harder. That was your prescription, wasn't it? Never even occurred to me to wonder why the freedoms that were guaranteed to people of color by the 13th and 14th Amendments to the Constitution of these United States were so blithely and brutally ignored by so many of those states. Mm. Sadly, it wasn't all that long ago when, when I would see a black mother or a father on television maybe being interviewed for some 30 minutes after their teen had been gunned down by police or a toddler had been killed by a stray bullet from a gang war. 90% of the time, there didn't seem to be tears, no hysteria. There was some tangential anger, yeah, but, but it would seem more like annoyance to me. And delivered by these people with an almost off-handed, sing-song, matter-of-factness that I found very puzzling and extremely off-putting. I mean, in their place, what would I do in the very unlikely event that such a thing would happen to me? How hysterical would I get? How, how inconsolable would I sob? Assuming I was not already in a state of collapse, struck dumb with grief, unable to speak to anyone, certainly let alone the press. My message to self back then? Hmm. Many blacks seem capable of experiencing deep, complex emotions. These people of color having suffered four centuries of pain, violence, injustice, and increasingly creative means of oppression. But that, too, was another of my considered opinions. My God. So what do I do with all the shock and horror at my own lifetime of complicity? I have my sincere, but who knows, time to tell, maybe superficial desire to do something to atone for it. But beyond this very white one-woman therapy session I'm trying to perform, does this qualify, do you think, as group therapy? Even though I'm a one-woman, but there's you. But anyway, otherwise, I, I really don't know what to do. Maybe I could ask a black person and actually try to stop talking and listen for the answer. I could ask a black person if I need one. Maybe I could start by making a black friend. More than a little embarrassing to be halfway through whatever this is before I admit I don't even have one. You never have had it. Unless you count Oprah and Barack. Not in person, of course, yet. In my defense, I don't have many friends, period, of any color. I'm sure that comes as a great surprise to you. I have kept Amazon busier than usual lately, though, and I can at least claim I've been introduced in a way to the estimable Frederick Douglass. And of course, my new best friend, the aforementioned Isabel of Cass. And hey, Maya and Tony and I go way back. Same with Jimmy Baldwin. And of course, my cinema friendships include James Zero and Sydney. Of course, my feelings for Denzel are not exactly platonic, but <laughs> <laughs> I watched all the boots back in the day. And I love Joy Reid and her posse and all the rest of them on MSNBC. They're going to get another photo in a page or two. And my grandson, a couple of summers ago, gave me a tutorial on Jay-Z and Kendrick Lamar, who, by the way, won a Pulitzer in 2019. Mm -hmm. And I even liked a black man, liked a black man on Match.com, back in August. But that's because as I come to even knowing a black person, which is a whole lot sadder than it is funny, so maybe we should conclude the humor portion of the program which I can't say you're all that 28 anyway. 51%? Yeah, I don't know, it's a stretch. But back in 2006, in person or not, Barack Obama did change my life. Simple as that. 
Not at first, back when you're early off, like the better part of three years, coming off an emotionally devastating breakup, during which time I didn't read the paper, I didn't listen to news, watch anything on the tube beyond HGTV and surprise the term movie classics. But then with a new relationship, this is how it goes, my viewing habits expanded. My partner was kind of a cable news junkie. So I was introduced to a wide range of commentators, among whom were some highly intelligent, highly articulate pundits of color, and somehow just appeared while I'd been hibernating, I guess. Eugene Robinson, Maya Wiley, Eddie Floyd. I know. I know Joe Biden got in trouble calling him Barack Obama articulate. <laughs> but you know, Joe Biden's white, and he's almost a boomer, so that may explain. But those correspondents on MSNBC were part of my slow motion awakening, just in time to lead up to the 2008 presidential election. Of course, I was a Hilly Hillary girl at first. I mean, the first woman candidate for a major party for president, committed, brilliant, qualified. I saw that presumptuous young black man as an upstart, an interloper. I shouldn't even bother to learn his improbable name, Barack Obama. How pretentiously African-American could it get? <laughs> Though I have to confess, that declaration of his candidacy was very moody. It was on the steps of the Chicago Public Library, the State House, but whatever, it impressed me. But what impressed me more was his speech, A More Perfect Union, about his relationship with controversial pastor Jeremiah Wright, specifically, and the black American experience in general. And it so hugely, hugely impressed me, and he's kept impressing me ever since. It's also about the time I began to feel this intermittent queasiness because I was waking up to myself and my country. It's no accident that I finally began writing this, this thing, coincidental with the deaths of civil rights and House of Representative icons Elijah Cummings and John Lewis. The wave of deep affection and admiration from all corners of the nation, of the world, that attended the passing of those humble heroes powerful mix of grief and gratitude expressed by their colleagues, their friends, their families, their constituents, and garden variety citizens like me has proved an elixir of inspiration. No, it's no accident any more than the cosmic timing of George Floyd's tragic death, or Breonna Taylor's, or this whole crazy COVID timeout that has been provided by the real powers that be who and whatever they are. For a whole world that's been behaving badly for years, decades, centuries. You might not get religion from witnessing this perfect cosmic storm. As far as I'm concerned, realize that this tiny toxic bad seed of racism is at the root of it all. Pernicious populism, racial reckoning, and even this equal opportunity pandemic. It's all kind of a divine intervention. And make no mistake, for a world that's been addicted to drugs, alcohol, money, sex, technology, power, hate, blah, blah, for so long, it is an intervention. <clears throat> but I think, I think this all must have started happening a long time ago, when the fear first started seeping in. After all, for centuries, the white man had nearly complete dominion, physical, legal, cultural, political, over everything, certainly over the person who's been made a slave. So when did that chronic, corrosive terror take hold? Obviously, there's some kind of formidable power in being black. There must be. Apparently, one drop of blood, which, by the way, is red, of black blood can turn a lily white baby black. And, and gallons of white blood, which I believe is also red, isn't enough to turn a black baby white? Powerful stuff, that blackness. Half the white boys, young men that I've known in the past decade or two, they also seem to be trying to turn themselves black. The music they listen to, their sports heroes, how they walk, how they talk, how they wear their pants. The irony of it. White men, and I apologize to my brothers, but white men poor things. I wasn't going to go into this, it's another show, really, but a couple of decades ago, when this wannabe black phenomenon began to take serious hold of our white boys, I came up with a theory that white men particularly are the most at-risk, loveless demographic in the nation, maybe the world. 
They didn't think any real role models that existed for them anymore. Nothing to guide them to lives of dignity and honor and a, an addicted society that their own white male power structure had spawned. I made a case that all the other special interest groups, from women to people of color to LGBTQ, had developed aspirational goals that were fueled by shared grievances and the promise of autonomy and freedom at the end of the struggle, primarily because of the prejudice and oppression they'd suffered under the boot of that WMPS, white male power structure. WMPS. Maybe that's a white male version of PMS. I don't know. <laughs> I love a theory. See, white men have no oppressive power structure to push against. They were stuck in this vice of their own ingrown influence and privilege. Maybe being so afraid, they were unable to change. They've been unable to grow. Kind of a death sentence, really. As I wake up to my own accidental racism, I'm beginning to understand to the extent that I'll ever be able to what it must have meant to not only be black, but a black man in America. For centuries to be categorically disrespected, disenfranchised, disempowered, disinherited, denigrated, and even literally and figuratively dismembered. I remember a couple of decades ago talking about how weak black men were as if they had a genetic defect. And for evidence, only one, one only had to point to society, the societal matriarchy that is supposedly emerged in most black communities. God, how boundless was my ignorance. The white men should have been afraid, yeah, after 400 years of exerting relentless subjugation over innocent people, the WMPS and its carefully crafted institutional racism have managed to sap a, a great deal of strength from generations of people of color, especially black men. And yet, rejected on so many levels by white society, these people have still managed to create, in answer to that rejection, a vibrant, very hugely, hugely influential culture. While today the suicide rate for white men between the ages of 40 and 70 sadly speak for themselves. But here's the thing. For whites, this, this fear of the black man may be ever present, but it's really <laughs> subconscious unless a black man or the blacks are posing some kind of perceived immediate threat like moving next door or walking towards you on the street. I'll bet the vast majority of you whites never even consciously think about them. Unless, of course, we're neo-Nazi skinheads, skin and game heads, if you will. Or a, a white supremacist and white nationalist. There's so many names for, but you know, for the same thing. I mean, uh, oh, let's see, so many names. Like any other, they think the same. We, I didn't, we should have taken that line down anyway. In which case, they perceive the mere existence of people of color as an immediate threat. And as such, they think about them constantly. But most of us now, we don't think about them. I told you. Because most of us aren't skinheads or whatever. So we aren't like that. Like I said, we're not racist. And hey, blacks can stick around. We appreciate it. Because then no matter how poor or uneducated we are, as long as we're white, if so, we can be better than right? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just surmising here that likely blacks, on the other hand, have been thinking constantly about whites for the past 400 years. And I mean daily, because whites have actually presented a constant existential threat to them for 400 years. It's been in their best interest of life and limb to know whites inside and out, how to handle them, humor them, and when necessary, hoodwink them into harmlessness as if their lives depended on it, which it frequently, frequently did. As well as they know us, and they do. Even they are unaware of the depths of white ignorance, maybe even more than we are, because it's so hard to believe. But see, there's a payoff for white standing asleep. Ignorance is bliss when our blindness to white privilege keeps us blameless. Mm -hmm. Uh-uh, this is where I have to make some cool cuts. Faulkner said that in writing this Kill Your Darlings, and this is literally what I was doing right here at this moment. So Tempest Fugits, this thing was going on and on, so I cut a whole bunch of stuff. And you know what, once I started, it was a bloodbath. <laughs> a lot of stuff, but you probably think it was a mercy to me. You're so lucky. But anyway, what was cut was, it was a really insightful movie review 
about Pleasantville from 1995. It's a great extended metaphor for racism, I think, so see it if you can. About a kid who gets trapped in a 50s black and white sitcom where everyone's colorblind in one extent or another. But it struck me. Aren't we like that, though? What an irony that when confronted with the possibility of our unintended racism, the most enlightened of us often protest, oh no, I'm colorblind. How right we are, not the way we think. We don't want to be racist. We don't consciously want to exclude people. But we are, and we do, because we are colorblind. Blind to the people of color, to their painful history, and our part in it to the continuing challenges of prejudice that they still face every day that we still so easily ignore. So even with the best intentions, when we pretend that color doesn't exist, that the people of color are just like whites, as if white was still the white gold standard for being human, we make people who are already invisible to us virtually non-existent. And so when glimpses of their American history or their challenges in their daily lives come fleetingly into focus, they're invariably encrusted with the otherness we whites have been bred to perceive. Perfect example, the controversy over the Confederate Civil War statues. There wouldn't be a controversy if we, all Americans, could see slavery as an abomination that happened and in many ways is still happening one way or another to all of us and not just to them. So, okay, with all this yammering on and on, how did slavery happen to me? Of what have I actually been deprived? In what possible way have I actually suffered? That's the thing, isn't it? The fact is, that I'll never know. Having been trapped in a white privileged prison, I'll never know what human connections, creativity, common causes, inspiration might have immeasurably enriched my life, and even vice versa. And none of us will ever know what human, what human connections, creativity, common causes, inspiration uh, uh, might have happened if the Americans who happened to be born with darker skin hadn't had to battle for 400 years, generation after generation, of discrimination and oppression. No question that they have achieved extraordinary things. But what further masterpieces, medical breakthroughs, social movements of heart and spirit that would have benefited all of us might have been accomplished by now. But here's the visual that speaks to where we are and not where we could have been. 29-year-old black father of three being shot in the back seven times in front of his small children. It happened in our heartland, you know, she was constant this past September. The man didn't die like so many before him. Michael Brown, Jameer Rice, Eric Garner, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and, and an endless bloody etc. of others stretching back decades. No, oh, he was only paralyzed and he was down. When he heard this tragic news, Doc Rivers, former player and now coach of the Los Angeles Clippers, responded with an anger and the deep sadness of the terrible news. He said, we keep loving this country this country doesn't love us back. Either the coach has been loving the wrong country, or some of us have. His is the one born of an idea, a divinely inspired message that came to its founding fathers, good men for the most part, in perfect they may have been, unequal to the task of fully manifesting that idea, but coming close enough to lift the hearts of all who listen and who are brave enough to open to it. We were only off by a couple of letters in one syllable. Of course, it should have been all humans are created equal. But the coach keeps loving this country anyway, that founded by imperfect humans was inevitably imperfect, but was loved by Lincoln too, whose passionate aspiration was that we continue to strive for a more perfect union. That's the country the coach loves. How much closer might this country, the one we actually have, have come to that more perfect union that for the last century and a half, so many of us had squandered so much energy on keeping this nation white in the face of the inexorable demographic change that was already underway by then. A uh, bad cosmic joke, really. I doubt that account for the 51% funny of this. Those whites of us left who are still hysterically clinging to the ghost of something that never really existed, whiteness, who have had 
who have uh, so much body, mind, heart, and spirit to share with their families, their communities, their countries, that is far beyond the color of their skin, but yet they've excluded themselves, have made themselves the outsiders, the real strangers. Well, I love the country the coach loves, the one that's striving and straining toward Lincoln's shining <coughs> idea but we've got to lean in this together and work to remove every vestige of the deadly cancer of racism. I know that a more perfect union could be reached by our children or grandchildren, unless too much damage is done in the meantime in the next 10 or 15 years. The flame may be out by the time they're able to take the torch. That's why I'm putting the spotted whitish old hide in front of mine into the game. Hopefully it's better late than never. The game of making this country what it claimed to be for the past two centuries plus. <clears throat> Maybe I needed these past four hellish years. Please don't be bored. Please don't be bored. <laughs> Maybe, Maybe I couldn't have been shaken totally awake any other way. But now I'm showing up and standing up for a country the coach loves, that I love, and that I know you love. The best of which is no longer reserved for whites only anymore, but for all of us in spite of and because of our differences, disagreements, messy debates, for all the truly united citizens of all the truly united states of America, land of all the free, home of all the brave, and always, 